Thank you. So indeed, the talk is about technique for implementing a source to source compiler front ends and the technique is um, specific to racket uh, not for any fundamental reason but it just so happens that so far no other language has all the required features as far as far as i know i'll get back to what these features are in any case, the idea is that we implement a racket language, racket-based language, and we can evaluate it normally in, in the virtual machine or target some foreign language. And, well, there are different reasons for targeting other languages, but maybe we are targeting a platform whose vendor does a nice job of supporting a particular language and it would be convenient to deploy via that or maybe we even want to abstract over multiple other languages if we create multiple backends then we can do that but okay we can implement source to source compiled language but why why would we want to make it a racket based language um, so one obvious benefit is that if it's a proper embedding, then we can use existing Racket tools to a large extent. And yesterday, for instance, we heard about Dr. Racket and refactorings. And particularly in the case of Racket, one motivation might be that we might want to make our language extensible, self-extensible by exposing the Racket macro system to the language. It's quite a capable macro system. And that's indeed sort of the primary motivation why I have been looking at this. So our group is working on so-called moldable programming and that can use some language support. And lots of this language support revolves around compile time. So it seems a good fit to, to uh, have a macro system as well. And if we consider the situation of course there are quite a few tools for you know language workbenches for implementing languages but usually they don't really offer any support for creating languages such that you can extend the languages from within themselves they can be good at externally extending those languages uh, there's one exception is Sugarstar a recent language workbench and of course Lisps have a long tradition this kind of thing and here we have some Magnolisp code. Magnolisp is the example language used in the paper. Or is it Magnolisp? Is it, is it Racket? Well, you can use the Racket macros there. And indeed, the syntax is Racket style, but the language is different in that it's statically typed and it's not functional either. But you have the option of either running in Racket or compiling to C++ shown here. Um, so, okay, if we run code in Racket, what we have to do is we have to basically tell the Racket system what language our code is in. So here we are saying that we have Racket code and we have our program here. And to evaluate this in the Racket environment, What's involved is macro expansion, byte compilation, and execution in the VM. And then it prints, he prints Hello World. How do we define a language? Well, it's implemented as a module. The module has to export the names uh, for the namespace of that language, the base namespace. And that can include, and probably does include, Syntax, surface syntax defined as macros, and uh, some other stuff like variables there may be, and then you also have to specify a reader that converts text into syntax objects, and syntax objects are Racket's native data type for code fragments.
but then if we if we want to translate to some other language we don't want to run in the racket VM then we have to have some solution for getting the syntax tree of our module and many solutions have been used uh, here's some of them and for example yesterday we heard about the uh, Cimera uh, solution which does this by basically arranging it so that evaluating the code module will uh, produce AST uh, instantiations and so we get our AST that way but the solution uh, described in the paper is this one somewhat similar but it's different in that if we want to just access the AST for transcompilation we don't actually have to evaluate this this module in, in, a, in a normal sense so the idea is that we implement our language uh, Magnolisp in this case and we define the language so that it exports its own syntax for transcompilation and the way this is done is that we arrange for the macros of the language to to expand in, in the module in such a way that we include a nested module within the expansion and that nested module contains code which if it is run will instantiate an AST or some other representation and if we evaluate the same expanded mod module normally then it will evaluate as normal in the racket VM so we have these two different modes that we can use to run this expanded module so either the normal mode or the transcompile mode so that we get get our syntax tree and can transcompile but okay how do we actually implement the macro expansion in such a way well there are some steps for one thing we have to be able to get the entire syntax tree of the module somehow and well this is this is very easy because every racket language has to define a macro called module begin which will be given as argument the entire module body so we have that trivially but the problem is that this will be unexpanded code so if there are some macro uses in this module then we will have a hard time parsing that syntax so we, what we want is the expanded form the core syntax of the of our language and the way to do this is to invoke a racket function called local expand this will expand then our entire module body and then we have a fully expand, expanded form of that and then we can do something with, with that uh, so what we might do is we can just return the syntax as is for the racket e VM evaluation but then we might also insert this submodule something like this and when this expands it ends up looking like this and if this module then gets byte compiled this uh, submodule it can be loaded separately from the parent module so that uh, we don't actually need to run this uh, parent module code and we don't get any side effects either from this like hello world doesn't get printed on the screen or anything like that uh, okay so submodules are, are, are fairly, fairly recent addition to racket so this hasn't really been an option to do it this way for too long uh, so okay it's, it's sort of cool that this uh, is possible to Im implement a language like this but is it is it useful is it just sort of a curiosity that we, we can do this but there is actually some benefits so for one thing we can use uh, rackets own build manager to 
to, see, to serialize these modules, which have been already expanded, and all the macros have been expanded, and byte compilation has happened, so that we don't, if we have to do a lot of work to prepare uh, for transcompilation, for instance, we then can sort of save this work, and the racket build tool will take care of that. And another nice thing is that this puts the language itself in control. So if we implement a new language, we can decide which transcompilers do we support for this language by including the appropriate submodules in, in there as we implement the racket language. So we can reuse compilers in that way, perhaps. Um, and to, to really get full reuse out of the racket um, infrastructure, what we want to do is certainly have a racket compatible name resolution and also S expression syntax helps so that we can then uh, sort of more com compatible with the macro system as well and we can sort of use concrete syntax patterns as some re really advanced environments support some language workbenches. Um, now, what about if our language doesn't have the same core syntax as, as Racket has? How, how do we deal with this? Well, during macro expansion, Racket only exp expects to see its own core forms. So we have to somehow make it look like that's what we have. But, um, for example, one option is to Racket does it's, it's fine with seeing variable uses as long as they are bound, so we can use a variable with, with variable binding to identify our own core language forms, for example. So this, for instance, is part of the Magnolia surface syntax. It's um, type expression, and this is the way it expands. And the result of the expansion only contains racket core forms, and it contains a use of our special variable that we can use to identify this as our, our core form. And there's also some coded data in here that tells us what kind of syntax uh, node this is. This is one solution. The paper has others. Um, Well, there is also, also um, a translator from these submodules to C++ as, as part of the Magnolia distribution. But the technique disp described in the paper doesn't really co concern this part of the compilation, this middle end and back end. So it's mostly just the front end. So the main point here is that you just run the submodule, you get your AST, and then you do something to compile it further, whatever you want. And in the case of this Magnolis compiler, that something is just some racket pattern matching and some generic traversals implemented in terms of um, strategy combinators. And since we have this compiler for Magnolisp, we can then reuse it with other, other languages. So that's what we, we did with a research language called Erda. This language is sort of for research language for looking at error handling, and there's something weird going on, some good and bad values here. So the semantics is different, even though this looks a lot like Magnolisp. But just by inserting the expected kind of submodule in there as part of the, magno, the macro expansion of this language, we end up with something that's fully compatible with the Magnolia compiler. We can use it unmodified with this language. So that's, uh, that's nice. Um, some, there, there might be concerns about debugging, as always, when transcompilation is involved. So the source language is not the same as the language that is being run. And also when you have macros, the uh, 
the distance between the source and the target uh, is longer, but the nice thing is that Racket does some work for you trying to keep track of the origins of pieces of code through macro expansion. So for instance, the Magnolisp Compiler makes use of the uh, location information found in the syntax objects in order to fetch the original source code for purposes of error reporting. This seems to work uh, fairly well. Um, and another nice thing is that if we now expose the racket macro system to the language that we are implementing as as we did with Magnolis, for, for instance, then we probably don't need to implement entirely separately some other compile time mechanisms such like uh, conditional compilation or map types, but it's quite easy to do these with some short macros in terms of the uh, more general macro system. So here, for example, we have conditional compilation. We are checking are we targeting Qt or plain vanilla C++ or what kind of mappings should we use if we want to generate familiar looking code. And I'll finish here. Um, the, uh, if you have Racket installed, you can install Magnolisp with this, this command. And I'll uh, take any questions you may have. What do you mean by ratio? Uh, I don't really know, line to line. Well, it, well, here there is not much of a difference, but I mean, of course, sort of the point of exposing the uh, macro system is that I think we saw some extreme examples yesterday where people did some inlinings using macros and the expansion was much longer. So even though there's really no difference in the proportion. In this case, in such a basic case, if we start using macros that generate lots of functions from a single declaration or something like that, as might be the case if we declare some structure type and accessors for it or, or do some inlining or whatever, then the ratio can quickly increase, of course. <laughs>